Well, the world has been shaking and America itself has been on the brink of social civil war for the past few years. Canada has been going through it. Australia has been going through it. The UK has been going through it. South America has been going through it. Not only are political parties extremely divided, there's been a racial battle, a gender war, a confusion of the identity of America itself and the country you're from probably is going through the same thing. In the midst of this in America though, Christians have been making some extreme statements that America is much like Rome was in its final days of collapse. Is it true? Are we close to the end? I mean, that's one of the things that people have been saying around the world about America is America's time is up. A lot of Christians have said that. There's been people who used uh, biblical prophecy for this kind of thing. Is it true or, or can we give God more credit for his people here in America? than that? I mean, we are still the number one giving institute, the church in America in the world's history. We've given more money if you add it up than any other people group in the world in history at large. That's huge. And most of it has gone to the poor, widows, orphans, these kinds of things. So there's been a giving nature. There's also still Christian foundations in our nation that we haven't walked past yet. And so if you look past the timeline, it's been pretty amazing to see the signposts this last couple of years that point to transformation that are right in front of our eyes. And I'm gonna look at the past two years, some of the things that have happened. And starting last October, when Elon Musk he bought Twitter last October and it became a huge win for freedom of speech. Why? Because conservatives on all the big tech platforms were not allowed to speak and Christians were being marginalized where Facebook, Instagram, Meta uh, was the organization over them and also Google decided that you could no longer advertise Christian videos. They were actually throttling them on Twitter. They were throttling uh, conservative voices, which means they were um, giving them no play. They were hiding them in their algorithm and they were pushing agendas of the liberal left and the progressive left media and even socialism. And even in other nations, some of the worst mentalities on Twitter were coming from uh, there's terrorist groups, there's extremists and religions that were allowed to be on Twitter, but Christians were not allowed to be on Twitter in a way where they could have a lot of voice. And we watched people when, especially we hit some of the cultural wars in America, Twitter actually silenced the voice of Christians and conservatives. Well, Elon Musk changed that because back in October 27th last year, he bought Twitter and although it's been a rocky road of true freedom of speech, it's there. And we're watching things like everything from Daily Wire with Matt Walsh was able to show what is a woman documentary, which was a huge win or just women at large to be able to see this video is one of the most viewed documentaries now in history because Elon Musk helped to put that out there on his platform for free with Daily Wire in partnership. And again, it was a clunky relationship, but it happened. And then groups like Babylon B, who is a sar uh, very sarcastic, I love them, satire, Twitter was able to be reinstated because Twitter didn't like him before when they were making jokes about you know the transgender agenda, not transgender people, transgender agenda, or about the LGBTQ plus stuff or about the extreme woke left. But as soon as Elon Musk came back on board or bought the whole system, he put Babylon B front and center again and said, let's do it. And so all of a sudden this town hall online of Twitter became a way which they're still developing an algorithm that's going to be open source, a way for everybody to have a voice, everybody to be able to speak. And the limitations would be more against illegal things versus freedom of speech things. And I think that's huge. Well, then November 20th, 2022, The Chosen Season 3 released two episodes in theaters, which made box office records for a TV series there. Later, The Chosen became the biggest series on the CW network, which, I mean, it became bigger than their own shows. I, I just still think that's huge that this young adult channel, CW Network, which had things like Vampire Diaries and Riverdale and the, you know Supernatural, all these kinds of shows, the CW, which is already placed in about five other places you can watch it, gets put on their network and it becomes their biggest series. Also, The Chosen has been watched by 110 million people and it's been awakening a hunger for Jesus that no other media has ever done quite this way. I know the Jesus film is amazing and has brought salvation to the missional world around the world. But The Chosen has really appealed to the Western mindset and has caused people to look at Jesus in a very different way. And The Chosen has been one of those series that's been a before and after moment in culture. And season four is something that the whole world's looking forward to. Then we have January of this year, Amazon Prime started a faith-based division. One of our friends, Tracy Blackwell, is one of the heads of that division. And they're starting to put together, as one of the biggest streaming services, they're starting to put together a faith content that doesn't have... I don't know. It doesn't have the problems that a lot of the other groups that are trying to do faith-based media that our sector groups have. And so we're going to see more and more come from that. But that also triggered Netflix and other streaming services to go, how are we serving the faith community? And there's been more and more talks behind the scenes. Of course, we have Lionsgate, who's also got on board several years ago, 2018, 
and has made us, uh, I think it was a five picture deal or more with the Irwin brothers. And then there's, they've continued that with other kind of faith-based projects as well as the chosen, which is so exciting. But then we had something really spectacular happen. One of the most spectacular things that ever happened on mainstream television, January 3rd, sadly, DeMar Hamlin collapses on the field and players rushed the field to pray for him. And all of America was watching as well as people from around the world. And it started one of the biggest prayer meetings in history for this young man's life who had to be resuscitated on the field. And they were saying he wasn't going to live like the medical team that was involved had to intubate him. And they were saying that he probably wasn't going to make it. And something happened miraculously through prayer. Now he was resuscitated. He went to the hospital and many people who were in the medical staff around him didn't give him hope to play again that year. And they were also saying that it may be that your career's over. We're not sure yet. Well, prayer kept happening. Even on ESPN, one of the newscasters said, I know we don't normally do this, but let's pray in the name of Jesus for DeMar Hamlin. And we had people praying all over Twitter, all over Instagram, all these places for DeMar Hamlin, who had a miraculous recovery in front of all of America. We watched the supernatural power of God bring a miracle that's a before and after moment in history because everybody said it was a miracle. People on ESPN said it was a miracle. The medical staff said it was a miracle. The NFL said it was a miracle. The church said it was a miracle. And of course, Tamar Hamlin, thank God for his life that he still gets to live and play football still. And I just think that was one of the most amazing moments because we watched the power of prayer and where Jesus wasn't being said a lot on mainstream television where players were saying well wishes or we were sending good vibes. Vibes, really. Fives. They went from that to say, I actually am praying in the name of Jesus. Several players, and we're, we're talking about dozens of players, came back to Jesus in their faith because of what happened with DeMar Hamlin. I've talked to chaplains in the NFL. I've talked to people in the NFL, and they said that there hasn't been an incident like this, an incident like this in modern history where someone's life had so much impact on people's faith who are other players in the NFL. And we're so grateful that God healed him, that he's playing again, but also for the move of God that's happened behind the scenes in sports, but also right in front of America's face, if not the world. Then February 8th, something really marvelous happened. The first meeting of the Asbury Revival Service happened. And this was so incredible because it was an outpouring that started with a chapel service where a young man was teaching. It didn't feel like he was doing the greatest job in the world, but the meeting kept going from that point on. And people, tens of thousands of people came. There was no celebrity pastor. There was no celebrity worship leader. There's no celebrity involved. It was just an organic move of God with Generation Z. And we watched young people from all over the nation erupt at their colleges with protracted meetings. Some of them are still having meetings weekly to this day with a fire in their belly for the love of Jesus. And this was a generation, you have to realize last year was being reported by many researchers and church statistic builders that Generation Z was the most unreachable of all the generations that are alive right now. And yet we're seeing the opposite happen right now where the Asbury Revival pointed at something that was so important. Even Time Magazine reported about it and said that it was uh, such a special time. I just think it's like it was an awakening time. So you have secular mainstream media magazines even and news media that was reporting about it all over the United States. It was on the news every night as it was happening in most major uh, cities in most major regions. Then February 10th, uh, he gets us campaign targeted an ad to people who may never go to church at Super Bowl Sunday. Now you have to realize a uh, billionaire benefactor came up and there's now several people who've come behind an organization called He Gets Us, who's a true Christian organization and said, let's reach people who are not reached, who the church will never reach, who will never set foot in the church. How do we do this? And they came up just like Billy Graham. You have to realize Billy Graham, when he first started, he started to use mainstream uh, advertisement techniques to advertise this crusade. The very first crusade was here in Los Angeles and they did commercials. And it was the first ministry ever even considered. And it was very controversial to do commercials to advertise that they were going to be doing an event in LA. And that event was completely packed with standing room only on the outside of the stadium. And there was thousands of people who got saved in that stadium. And that started a precedence for how the Billy Graham association went after evangelism. Well, he gets us as doing something very similar but very outside the box. And they they placed two ads at the Super Bowl and there were ads to target people to rebrand maybe what they would think about Jesus. Maybe they had a certain image they grew up with, or maybe they didn't know anything about Jesus, but they just heard of Christianity, maybe in a negative light. And they wanted to give people an experience with Jesus through these ads. And they spent uh, $20 million plus on ads for the Super Bowl. And they have a billion dollar campaign going for He Gets Us. And it started really, it started last year, but February 10th was their big something that's never happened in history before that actually awakened people 
and they're getting so many people saved. They're also partnering to Glue, which also went, launched last year. And Glue is offering churches AI and text technology for free. And they're training churches and they're giving the fruit of campaigns like he gets us and other campaigns. They're giving local churches the fruit, meaning salvations, to be able to disciple and 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 integrate these people into their churches. And it's such a beautiful process. So that started that launch as far as that that campaign on that greater level, February 10th. And I think that's incredible. Well, February 24th, right after that, it wait, it gets better. Wait, there's more. Jesus Revolution movie came out. And this was so important because our generation who feels very controversial, there's unreached people groups in our generation. There's an us versus them mentality from the church to the world. There's religious intolerance. There's people who are sick of being in the traditional norms. You know, and that was happening during the hippie pe- people movement. And during that time, there was a radical outbreak of God's love and it caused a generation of people to get saved. And this you know, we've heard about this. Maybe your grandparents were involved. Maybe your parents were involved. Maybe you got saved through the Jesus people movement. But this Jesus people movement has been talked about, but there's been no way, I mean, maybe church history and scholars talk about it, but there's been no current expression to where people can really relate to what happened. And then all of a sudden, a movie that was supposed to come out last year, it came out this year around the same time. Why the Asbury renewal, outpouring, whatever you call it, was still happening, along with a lot of colleges that were hosting protracted meetings, including mainstream colleges like Texas A&M and others. All of a sudden, this movie comes out and it gives our generation a vision of what a move of God could look like. It was called Jesus Revolution with Kelsey Grammer, who rededicated his life to to Jesus during this time and had other uh, famous celebrities as well in this movie. And it's the story of Greg Laurie, Pastor Greg Laurie from Harvest Crusades. And this became a phenomenon. People saw this movie. It was supposed to be like a little niche independent movie. And it became a wild box office success competing with some of the biggest movies in February and March. And it was just had a long run in the movie theater, but it was giving and imparting a vision or what a move of God could look like to all kinds of people, young and old, from different racial backgrounds, to say, wait, we're in a time where there's political unrest, there's wars and rumors of wars, there's things that are happening that are out of our control. And when these people were in that same kind of time, very similar, Jesus used the unlikely, the most unlikely people group to bring a move of God, and it's going to happen again. Well, I mean, more stuff was happening all through the summer. We saw June through August, more people baptized and saved in summer camps than there had been recorded in the history of these camps for youth and adults. The top 10 summer camps talked about there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Even some of the conservative camps were saying we've baptized and had more salvations than we've ever had in our history. This is huge. It's a huge indicator that something's happening. This all happened organically. No one's saying, well, because of Asbury, we're going to have a move of God here. This just happened spontaneously because God is on the move. And there's times that he... Uh, manifests his presence. He's always mon- omnipresent, but there's times he, which means he's everywhere all at once, but he, there's times he manifests his presence for his purpose. And we're seeing that. Well, then we have July 4th, Sound of Freedom comes out and awakens compassion and it breaks the box office mold where you can actually pay for somebody else or groups of people to go to see this. And it hit the box office and it hit it hard where all of a sudden the eyes of a generation looked at an issue that's one of the most central issues that should be so grievous to our human spirit that there's more people being trafficked in our generation than there and and enslaved in our generation there has been all generations put together and we're seeing this incredible movie that's based on a true story of uh tim ballard who was working you know in this field and it was just an incredible story that awakened a generation it became a a definition for so, so many people to say i have to do something about this i don't want to see this happen anymore and it, it was very much a Will, William Wilberforce moment where William Wilberforce used his influence and his position to abolish slavery in his generation. And this movie moved the needle. It moved the needle in a real way, but it also showed Angel Studios who helped make this movie possible. They, it helped Angel Studios to create a model where you could actually, again, pay it forward, allow someone else to go see it. And you can watch Jim Caviezel at the end of the movie say, hey, there's people who want to see this movie who may not be able to afford it. Would you pay for them to go? You could do something about this. You could raise advocacy. We only have a moment in time here over the summer where people will watch this with this much zeal. So could you help? And it was very heartfelt and passionate to watch Jim Caviezel and then watch interviews with Tim Ballard and watch this issue of human trafficking get highlighted in a way that brought love and possibly bring justice in our generation to this issue. Well, alongside of that, right after that, July 8th, we have a Harvest Crusade, which is Greg Laurie's uh, yearly crusade, which was done this year in particular, though, we might have had the largest baptism in history over at uh, Pirate's Cove, where the original Jesus People movement 
was breaking out back in the 70s and where Greg Laurie himself was baptized. He baptized over 4,500 people, if not more. Uh, here's some pictures from, from Virus Cove. What a beautiful time that this happened. Well, this also, just a month before, another group called Baptized California came together with churches from all over Los Angeles and Southern California region, and they baptized at least two to 4,000 people. There's, we can't get an accurate estimation of the number, but we know it's in the thousands, and that's huge. I just love that this happened. Then, October 6th, the terrible war in Israel starts, but it rallied some of uh, the largest support of a small nation in history, and it rallied our nation to actually be in majority unity, even though it may only feel like majority unity is 75 to 85%, it's majority unity over a very controversial subject. And finally, we had October 25th, we had the conservative Speaker of the House that was a kind of a dark horse, a person that nobody expected to win. Mike Johnson won the conservative Speaker of the House. And we've already seen a lot of changes since then that his Christian office that he's looking at as a Christian missionary office he's holding is bringing to the nation and bringing to the world. Well, I love that there's been box office wins too. Almost every month this year and last year, there was a box office win for Christians where a faith-based project or a movie created by Christians won the box office, came in the top you know, three to 20 spots. It's never happened in history where there's been so many months progressively in a row that so many Christian uh, show, movies have won the box office. We also heard Matthew Perry, the, the, the great friend star who's passed away now, he spoke in his best-selling book about experiencing the presence of God. And right before his untimely death, this book was released, and he shared over many interviews about feeling the presence of God. It became a moment that was a light in the sand for him. We also saw celebrities like Kat Von D, who's a tattoo and makeup artist, get born again and baptized all in this year. It's been so profound. Of course, we know the Supreme Court wins, like abortion being overturned just a little while ago. We've had so many good wins, and I want to just tell you about these wins because I feel like you need to look at what's been happening over the last two years. You've had a lot of bad news, but there's a lot of really good wins, and God is conditioning us as a people to get ready for what I think is going to be a historic outpouring of his presence where there's going to be a lot of people saved, a lot of incredible things are going to happen, and people aren't just going to get saved. They're going to be positioned for what God brought them into existence for in the first place. I love that, that God is going to be appointing and and commissioning people to be missionaries to culture. And I'm going to be talking about that in my word, both here on this show, but also my word on Sunday. Make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, hit like so that you too can watch all the videos that we have every week. We have such great videos and a lot of them are topical. So some are going to be very interesting to you. But every Sunday, we have a Sunday prophetic service that's a supplement to your church experience. So make sure to join us for Sunday. And this week, I'm going to be talking about how God's commissioning people into areas of authority and influence. And some of you right now who are watching are those people who are being commissioned. And there's been a lot of transition to get you where you're at so he can anoint you and actually appoint you for something that you didn't expect right now. Make sure to join us for that. And it's coming up this Sunday.